Hello biology students, this is Mr. Gales and today I will talk to you about biotechnology. This is biotechnology screencast session number one. Uh, today we're going to begin by identifying what biotechnology is. Biotechnology can be defined as a set of biological techniques that are developed through basic research and can be applied to the development of new products. There are several aspects of biotechnology, several products that have been developed. I'm going to point out a few of them to you here. This first product is rather novel. This is an example of using biotechnology for a consumer product that really this is just adding a frill. These are called glow fish. The picture that you're seeing here, these are fish that actually glow in the dark. They combine a jellyfish gene into the genome of these normal aquarium fish. Another example of a Biotechnology would be a product used for the betterment of mankind. This is to produce a medicine. Um, this would be the technique used to, to essentially put a vaccine into a food product, in this case a potato. Um, there's a gene that's taken out of a pathogen that causes disease in humans and it's inserted into a bacterial plasmid. That plasmid then is put into the leaf of a plant, so the leaf segments sprout into the whole plant and that whole plant then carries the, uh, the gene for the human pathogen and so when you eat the potato what happens is your body begins to produce antibodies against that pathogen. It's a way for you to get natural defenses by eating a food rather than getting an injection vaccination. Another great example here of biotechnology is the production of food. Uh, in this case we're looking at the farming of Atlantic salmon in a much more efficient way. These fish, these two fish are the same age the fish on the top includes some, a gene from a Pacific eel and also from the Chinook salmon, which makes it grow twice as fast as uh, natural salmon. So these two fish, same species, same age, but this one on the top you can see is much larger. And then, uh, obviously this is the just the incredible or the weird aspect of biotechnology, tissue engineering, being able to take um, and grow human tissues for replacement parts on, you know, either in the lab or in this case we're growing a replacement human ear on the back of this mouse. So biotechnology has is a set of tools that allows us to produce a very wide range of products. Some of those products are novel, some of them are very useful like medicines, uh, some of them are, are produce greater efficiency like in the production of food, and some of them have the potential to help us uh, with treatments for human uh, medical problems. Now, the major focus for today's screencast is genetic engineering, and I think this picture really summarizes what genetic engineering is all about. If you look carefully here, you can see that what's happening is there is a gene sequence that appears to be from a different source, because you can see that it's red in color here, and it's being inserted into this uh, DNA molecule over here. So genetic engineering is really about recombining genes from different species or from different sources into one uh, DNA molecule. Uh, genetic engineering can be used to produce things like uh, pro plants that have natural medicines in them so that again when you consume the plant you're being you're getting a, a medical treatment, you're getting a, a vaccination against a pathogen or you may be getting some sort of essential chemical that your body needs. Uh, genetic engineering is also used to produce the glow-in-the-dark rabbits that we've talked about in class. This is a picture of glow-in-the-dark mice. We have here some uh, mice. These are hairless mice and you can see what they look like naturally. And then you can contrast that with these that have the, the, a gene that's called the luciferin gene that codes for the production of this glowing uh, bioluminescent protein here. So what we want to do is figure out how genetic engineering works. So let's begin with that right now. Uh, genetic engineering, first of all, can be defined as a process for manipulating genes for practical purposes. Uh, again, moving genes from one species into another species. And the first genetic engineering experiments were performed in the early 1970s. And the first one was really just to see, can we do this? Um, there was a gene for ribosomal RNA in a species of frog that some scientists were interested in seeing if they could move that gene into a bacteria. So what they did is they isolated the chromosome where that gene was found and they cut that gene out in essence and moved it into the bacterial genome. And what they found was at the end that they could identify the bacterial cells that had the gene in it and from there that those bacterial cells would produce the frog ribosomal RNA. I'm going to jump out of this presentation for a moment and show you an animation of this early genetic engineering experiment. One of the first genetic engineering experiments was conducted by Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer in 1973. 
They showed that the gene for frog ribosomal RNA could be transferred and expressed in bacterial cells. The first step was to construct the plasmid vector called PSC101. This constructed vector contained a single site for the restriction endonuclease ECOR1 and a gene for tetracycline resistance. The restriction endonuclease ECOR1 was used to cut the frog DNA into small fragments. Next, the frog DNA fragments were combined with the plasmid vector that had also been cut with ECOR1. The sticky ends of the DNA fragments aligned themselves and the segments were joined together using DNA ligase. Some plasmids incorporate genes other than the rRNA gene, and some do not incorporate new pieces of DNA. The plasmids were then transferred into a tetracycline-sensitive strain of Escherichia coli and plated onto a growth medium containing tetracycline. The cells that incorporated the plasmid carrying the tetracycline gene grow and form a colony of cells. Some of these colonies consist of cells that carry the frog ribosomal RNA gene. The researchers then tested the colonies that form after growth for the presence of frog ribosomal RNA. Okay, so that essentially lays out the, the simple steps of genetic engineering. And I say simple because there are really only four major steps involved. Um, the techniques involved with this we could actually do in the classroom if we had the materials. It's not that difficult to do. Um, but let's begin right now by looking at what those four steps are. Um, this, is, this is kind of an overview of the steps of a genetic engineering experiment in a way that is probably very easy for us to associate with because these are common objects. The four steps of a genetic engineering experiment include cutting the DNA. And you can think about cutting the DNA. We're using scissors. In this case, we're using molecular scissors called uh, DNA, uh, uh, I'm sorry, restriction enzymes that would be used to cut the DNA into pieces. The second step of the genetic engineering experiment is to make recombinant DNA. So essentially we're using the, the picture of tape here to represent the fact that we're gonna piece together back those, those various pieces of DNA that have been cut apart. Uh, cloning is the third step in the genetic engineering experiment and cloning involves making lots and lots of copies. So we're using the picture here of the photocopy machine. And then the final step of the genetic engineering experiment is the screening step, which involves in identifying the cells that are of value to you, the cells that have the gene of interest in them. So those are the four steps. We're going to be looking at those four steps now in turn with some pictures that will help you to understand each of those steps. All right. Now, step one, I mentioned, is cutting the DNA. And we're going to actually have to cut two different pieces of DNA. We're going to begin by cutting what's called the gene of interest out of the DNA molecule where it's found, and we're going to do that using something called a restriction enzyme. Now, the gene of interest is whatever gene that you eventually want to end up in your, uh, as your product. Uh, restriction enzymes are bacterial enzymes that will cut sequences of DNA in, in particular locations. So I'm going to play a, a video for you now. This is a brief video about the discovery and utility of restriction enzymes. The breakthroughs that led to some of the discoveries we've seen so far might never have happened if not for this familiar organism, bacteriophage. <clears throat> and our next discovery depended on it as well. For decades, it was believed that bacteria were completely vulnerable to invading bacteriophage. But in the 1950s, researchers found a wrinkle in that view. Certain types of bacteria were, in fact, resistant to being infected by a bacteriophage. How is that possible? The first answer was provided in 1962 by microbiologist Werner Arbor. He found that some bacteria had enzymes that fought back against the virus by cutting its viral DNA into pieces. This restricted the virus from taking over the bacteria. So they were called restriction enzymes. But how exactly did they work? Among those hoping to unlock that secret was microbiologist Hamilton Smith. Working in his lab in 1972, Smith was growing bacteria and bacteriophage together when he noticed that the DNA of the virus was breaking down. 
Smith acted quickly. He purified the restriction enzyme. Then he identified the exact place where the restriction enzyme had severed the DNA. Then came the moment of discovery. Smith found that the enzyme repeatedly cut the viral DNA in the same place. He had discovered the first site-specific restriction enzyme. With restriction enzymes, scientists now had a pair of molecular scissors they could use to cut DNA molecules to virtually recreate nature. This is significant. Today, this ability to manipulate DNA is one of the basic tools in genetic engineering, what's called recombinant DNA research. Since Hamilton Smith's discovery, hundreds of restriction enzymes have been identified, and scientists are using recombinant DNA for a world of applications on which we depend. Everything from the creation of more effective, less expensive drugs to the production of human insulin for the millions of diabetics worldwide who rely on getting their daily dose. Their daily dose. All right, uh, so restriction enzymes are important enzymes for biotechnology and genetic engineering. These are enzymes that are naturally occurring in bacteria and appear to play an important role in part of the defense system that the bacteria has against bacteriophages which we should remember from our DNA unit are viral particles that will infect bacteria and take over the bacterial mechanisms for reproduction, thus producing uh, many copies of themselves. So restriction enzymes prevent them from working. Uh, what you see here is a little flowchart that explains kind of the, the working of restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes, again, bacterial enzymes that cut DNA at very specific sites. Those specific sites are called restriction sites. Again, because it's restricting the, the virus by cutting it apart at, at certain locations. Uh, so in, in any restriction enzyme has this specific restriction site at, work at, at which it works. And when we cut the DNA, oftentimes the, the resulting cut that's produced is kind of a staggered cut. And you'll see a picture of that in just a minute. It, in many cases, restriction enzymes, when they make a cut, they produce something called a sticky end. And it's not literally sticky. It's sticky because it has... Um, exposed base pairs on one side of the molecule and those exposed base pairs can be complementary bonded to another DNA molecule. So it's, it's figuratively sticky in that sense. Now in a, a great example of a restriction enzyme is the restriction enzyme ECO-R1 and this is a restriction enzyme. You see the picture over here in the upper right hand corner of uh, ECO-R1 enzyme and its restriction site. It cuts uh, at a restriction site which is G-A-A-T-T-C. So anytime it sees that on a DNA molecule, anytime the enzyme uh, identifies that restriction site, it's going to land there and it's going to make a cut between the G and the A. So you can see on one side of the, of the DNA molecule it's going to cut here and on the other side of the molecule it's going to cut here. And so that those overlapping exposed nucleotide ends, those are called the sticky ends. I'm going to show you a video clip here of how ECOR1 does its job. And this will kind of help you to understand the concept of those sticky ends. Restriction endonucleases are enzymes that cleave DNA at specific nucleotide sequences. The sequence recognized is often four to six nucleotides long. For example, the restriction endonuclease, ECOR1, recognizes the sequence GAATTC. The nucleotides at one end of the recognition sequence are often complementary to those at the other end. The two strands of the DNA duplex have the same nucleotide sequence running in opposite directions for the length of the recognition sequence. Because the same recognition sequence occurs in both strands of the DNA duplex, the restriction endonuclease can bind to and cleave both strands of the DNA molecule. Because the bond cleaved is typically not positioned in the center of the recognition sequence and the DNA strands are antiparallel, the cut sites are offset from each other. After cleavage, each DNA fragment has a single-stranded end a few nucleotides long and the single-stranded ends of the two fragments are complementary to each other. These single-stranded ends can pair with each other, sticky ends. Once their ends have paired, the two fragments can be joined together with the enzyme DNA ligase, which reforms the phosphodiester bonds of DNA.
What makes restriction endonucleases so valuable is that any two fragments of DNA produced by the same restriction endonuclease can be joined together. Restriction endonucleases are fundamental tools in genetic engineering. All right, so we saw in that animation how the restriction enzyme ECOR1 cuts its DNA at the restriction site GAATTC, and the cut is made in such a way that the two strands have these over overlapping or overhanging free nucleotide sequences, which end up being called sticky ends, and that's very important. So the first thing that would happen is we would isolate whatever our gene of interest is. In the experiment that you saw earlier, the gene of interest was the, the gene that codes for frog ribosomal RNA. It could be the gene that codes for insulin in human beings. Whatever the gene is that we want to work with is our gene of interest. We're going to cut that out of its native DNA molecule. Now, the second thing that needs to happen is that we need to, uh, by the way, this is a picture of the restriction enzymes working. Uh, let me just show you that one more time. ECOR1 recognizing its restriction site, and it's going to cut between the G and the A here and here. We can very clearly see here the sticky ends that are produced on the two molecules, and then they can be rejoined together. We're going to get a, a come back to the idea of recombinant DNA in just a moment. Now, the other thing that needs to be cut, other than the gene of interest, is the vector. Um, a vector is any agent that you, is used to carry the gene of interest into another cell. Um, so oftentimes, um, we obviously are going to use uh, simpler substances. We're going to use substances that tend to reproduce very, very quickly. So some common examples of vectors include plasmids, viruses, and yeast. And the type of uh, vector that we're going to be talking about in class most often um, in this unit are plasmids. Plasmids are circular bacterial chromosomes. So if you see the picture up here, you have a bacterium, a bacterial cell, and the bacterium has a single bacterial chromosome, and then it has a plasmid, which is just a, a, a loop of DNA. That plasmid is going to be the vector that's going to carry our gene of interest. So when we take that out of the molecule, when we cut that out using the restriction enzyme, um, this is what we have. We have our, our ordinary circular plasmid and then we have our restriction enzyme that's going to find those restriction sites and it's going to make the cut and so now you see that we have a plasmid that's been opened up and it has sticky ends on either side just like the gene of interest would have all right so that's cutting dna we cut the gene of interest and we cut our vector uh, the next step in the restrict in the genetic engineering experiment is going to be to make the recombinant dna recombinant dna can be defined as dna that that it, it, is from two different sources or two different species joined together. Uh, the way that this works is the gene of interest it, uh, would be inserted into the plasmid. So you, here you can see the plasmid that's been opened up, cut open by the restriction enzyme with the sticky ends. This red piece here represents our gene of interest. So it's, it's literally going to bond together through complementary base pairing. These, these ends, the sticky ends, are complementary to each other. And then the second step is that the... the um, separate DNA pieces will be joined by ligase forming phosphodiester bonds. And the result that forms from that is the recombinant plasmid, which is a plasmid with DNA from different species. So the second step is making that recombinant DNA. The third step in the genetic engineering process involves cloning. Um, you're going to have bacterial cells which will take up that plasmid vector. There's a process that is done to to allow them to be able to take up that vector. We expose them to a certain chemical and it, it makes them what we call competent. They are competent for uptaking the vector. Um, so you can see in this picture here the process of those plasmids going back into those bacterial host cells. Now the host cell then is allowed to replicate so it's going to produce lots and lots of copies of itself and obviously the, the bacterial cells that have the desired gene in it as they make lots and lots of copies are going to make lots and lots of copies of that desired gene. So we're going to make uh, a tremendous number of DNA um, sequences of our desired gene by allowing the bacterial cell to replicate normally. All right, uh, the, this should actually say step four, screening. The last step is step four. It's called screening. And the idea here is to identify the cells that took up the desired gene. Uh, when we do um, genetic engineering, there are going to be some of those plasmids that, have, that are taken up that have our gene of interest. And here, from the experiment that you saw earlier, that's the frog ribosomal RNA gene. So that's the gene of interest. There will be other cells that have 
bits and pieces of recombinant DNA that we're not necessarily interested in. And then some of the plasmids won't have any foreign DNA in them at all. So, but we need to take up all of those bacteria and allow them to grow. Uh, we're going to allow them to replicate. And then we'll, we will identify the cells that contain the frog ribosomal RNA, in this case, the gene of interest. You can identify those. We can isolate them. And then we can allow them to replicate so that we're getting lots and lots of copies of the bacterial cell that produces the, the gene that we're interested in most. All right, these pictures sort of summarize the process. This is looking at the production of that, that recombinant gene or the recombinant plasmid that has the frog ribosomal RNA in it. But it really could be applied to any, um, any type of genetic engineering experiment you wanted to do. You would have your DNA with the gene of interest in it here and you would have your plasmid vector, and these would both be cut open using a restriction enzyme. So the restriction enzyme would, would cut the DNA into fragments, as you're seeing here. One of those fragments, obviously, would be the, you'd have a cut on either side of the gene of interest, so your gene of interest would, would be included in one of those fragments. Uh, here is the plasmid being cut open by the restriction enzyme. And here we have the, the production of the recombinant DNA. The, the fragments are joining with that cut open plasmid because of the sticky ends. And the DNA ligase comes in and joins those uh, pieces together with phosphodiester bonds. As you can see here, some of the plasmids are going to be recombinant with our gene of interest. Some of them will be recombinant with genes that are not interested, uh, of interest to us. And some of the plasmids simply won't have any uh, recombinant DNA at all. It'll just sort of reclose on themselves. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to plate those, we're going to have those, those plasmids taken back up by a strain of bacteria that would be sensitive to an antibiotic. This tetracycline is an antibiotic and it will kill off any bacteria that grow in its presence. And that's why at the beginning of the experiment you saw that they also include a little gene for something called tetracycline resistance. What that means is any of the plasmids that are taken up by these bacteria, any of the plasmids that could potentially have the recombinant DNA in them, our gene of interest, also have resistance to tetracycline, which will allow them to survive. So we take these bacteria and we allow them to grow then on this, uh, this is called an agar plate, and this plate contains the chemical tetracycline, which will kill off normal bacteria. And again, because our these bacteria that have the plasmids in them that we've produced have the tetracycline resistance gene, they will survive. And so what we can do eventually is identify those surviving bacterial colonies that produce our gene or our protein that we want, and we can encourage them to reproduce. We could uh, scoop them off and plate them on their own agar plate and allow them to, to reproduce and, and produce lots of their protein. Uh, so sort of to summarize the, what the products of genetic engineering are all about, uh, this, this picture is a, a really nice summary of the overall process of genetic engineering, but I want to focus on some examples of some products that we could end up with once the desired gene is cloned over and over and over again. Um, human growth hormone. This is literally a gene that produces a hormone that allows for growth in human beings. Some people are born with a faulty gene and they end up with um, growth disorders of many kinds. This growth hormone can be produced in bacteria and then isolated and produces a medicine for people that need it. Proteins that can dissolve blood clots in heart attack patients. These are, again, uh, genes that normally produce a protein that thin the blood, and it can be produced so that someone can take this medicine and um, their, their blood will be thinned out so that allows for easier passage through the uh, cardiac arteries and such. This is an interesting one. There's actually a gene that's used to alter bacteria so that it can clean up uh, waste, like, for instance, oil spill waste. And what it does is it allows this bacteria in some way to metabolize oil products and allows for the oil to be more easily cleaned up in oil spills. And then a very, I think a, a more commonly used example of genetic engineering here would be taking a gene for pest resistance and inserting it into a plant and then growing that plant up in a field so that, that when it's mature that it, uh, it's going to be resistant to many different forms of pests. This is, these are all very practical applications for genetic engineering. Now the next step in genetic engineering, uh, what we can make from genetic engineering are things that are called transgenic organisms, and this is our sort of our final concept on Screencast One. Transgenic organisms are organisms themselves, mature organisms that contain foreign DNA, recombinant DNA, so DNA from another species. And what this does is it alters the genetic material of the cells of the organism 
and allows them to either make new substances that they would not normally make or to perform new functions that would, they would not ordinarily be able to perform. So I come back to the, this is the Atlantic, this is farm-raised Atlantic salmon that has in it a gene from a Pacific eel and also from the Pacific Chinook salmon that allows it to grow a, approximately twice as fast as it, normal native Atlantic salmon that don't have that recombinant gene. And obviously that's important for being able to produce lots of food very quickly. Uh, the glow-in-the-dark mice, again, this, these are transgenic animals. These are animals that contain genes from jellyfish that allow them to glow in the dark. Another example here is this biotechnology corn. This is corn that has uh, genes in it that allow the corn to produce chemicals which can be used as medicine so that when we consume the corn that it has a medicinal value to it. Also, uh, could just simply be the, the production of corn that has pest resistance in it. And then uh, another great example here of transgenic animals, and this is one that is mind-blowing. Transgenic cows, for instance, that when they produce milk, when you milk the cow, actually has human protein in it. It could be um, a protein factor that allows for the treatment of burn victims. It could be insulin, for instance, so that when you milk the cow, you get the human protein out of it, and you can then use that for the treatment of, of some sort of uh, condition that humans might have. So I'm going to end today's screencast by showing you a video which kind of focuses on the production of these transgenic cows and transgenic pigs that have human proteins in them. Scientists may not feel all powerful in their work, but technically they are creating some new life forms. DNA from one species can now be spliced into another making genetically altered animals called transgenics. This is the breakthrough that the whole cloning area has really been waiting for to commercialize the effort and because we can make large numbers of identicals, but we can also do the genetic modifications. All those cattle are potential living drug factories. Geneticists are experimenting with adding a human gene to a cow's DNA. The result is a custom-made cow with medicines in its milk. The cow will give milk with human proteins in it, the same human proteins that are used to create some rare and life-saving medicines for burn victims and cystic fibrosis and hemophilia patients. The designer cow could make these super expensive and hard to get medicines more available. They could also create a billion dollar business. The proverbial cash cow. And that's not all they may be able to do with humanized cow's milk. This is Rosie, and she is the first step toward making human milk for babies that come from cows, not moms. Well, Rosie is a very special cow. She's about 20 months old, and she's the first cow that's producing a human protein in her milk. She's transgenic for human alpha-lactic albumin. This is a milk protein that's not normally present in the cow, and it's the first step towards humanizing cow's milk. Ultimately, you could envision eliminating all the cow milk proteins and replacing them with human milk proteins, milking a cow and having human milk come out. And if they can make just one of these cows, they should be able to make millions of these cows by cloning. We can get literally billions of these cells, and we can do all sorts of things with those in culture. And you look at the Petri dish full of these, you know, 100 million cells, and you think, gee, you know, this is uh, quite a large herd of cattle here because we can theoretically turn every one of those into a cow. The medical potential alone is awesome. Every year, over 55,000 people are waitlisted for an organ transplant that could save their life. Transgenic pigs could be the organ donors of tomorrow. This pig is being implanted with genetically engineered embryos. Their creators hope they will grow hearts that could be compatible with a human body. Before a transplant could take place, however, there are many obstacles to overcome not the least of which is the danger of introducing foreign viruses into the human race. Every time we tinker with nature's design, there are unknown consequences.
All right, so we have that final message about um, unintended consequences or consequences of changing nature. Obviously, that's why our understanding and our knowledge of biotechnology is very important. We need to continue to learn about uh, uh, how manipulating genes does, in the long run, impact natural species, and we continue that research on. So that's our first look at biotechnology with the process of genetic engineering, screencast session number one. In class, we'll be doing activities that will reinforce your understanding of genetic engineering. Remember, we have four major steps, cutting the DNA, making the recombinant DNA, cloning that recombinant DNA, and then eventually screening and identifying those cells that has the gene of interest in it. Big ideas today, restriction enzymes were important, sticky ends were important, vectors, and recombinant DNA. All right, so that's genetic engineering, and I'll see you next time in biology.